Ever wanted to drive the cheapest car in America or the safest car in America? You could at one time, according to Malcolm Bricklin. Malcolm Bricklin, a true businessman with the American dream attitude. You can make it as long as you go for it. A man renowned for his relentless persistence of always trying and see what sticks, of succeeding and failing but never giving up and always starting over again, for shaking up the auto industry every once in a while. This is episode 34 of the Automotive History series. This is the legend of Malcolm Bricklin. Since I'm a car channel, I'm gonna keep this short. Malcolm Bricklin was born in 1939 in Philadelphia and grew up in Florida. So far, so good. Life as a businessman was a predetermined career path as his father operated a chain of building supply stores. Malcolm helped his father to further develop the business and you know what, he became a millionaire in the process. At the start of his 20s, he was already swimming in cash. It's around the mid-60s Malcolm developed an interest in the world of cars, car building and the car business. At this time he started selling franchises of motor scooters, still quite popular in those days. The motor scooters came from a Japanese industry giant named Fuji Heavy Industries. Malcolm went over to Japan to make a new deal regarding the purchase of the Rabbit scooter and then rent it through a network of gas stations back in the USA. It was around this time Fuji Heavy Industries was also taking an interest in the growing car market in Japan and had released the Subaru 360 as their first effort of creating a small city car for the mass market a couple years before, in 1958. The ultra small 360, similar in size of the original Fiat 500, is a typical and so-called K car that complied with the Japanese regulations at the time. Powered by a 350cc or 21 cubic inch engine and a curb weight of 400 kilos or 900 pounds, it was a very fuel efficient automobile, getting 60 miles a gallon. Malcolm came for the scooters but stayed for the cars. It would still take another 5 to 10 years or so before the Japanese cars would invade the US car market en masse. But Malcolm already saw potential in cheap and reliable transportation from Japan as early as 1967. He wanted to import the Subaru 360. However, there was a slight problem. It's around the mid-60s when the US government actively starts to interfere with the car industry by coming up with safety and emission laws. And if you want a detailed description of this, go watch my Malays Era series. And by the looks of it, this would also directly impact the Subaru 360. And I don't have to explain to you that if you look at a 360, it's not the safest vehicle on the road. Crap. This was far from ideal, or so Malcolm thought, and so he went back to the US and visited Washington in an effort to read the up-and-coming regulations. And on page 1 of the document he found that motor vehicle was defined as a vehicle with a curb weight of more than a thousand pounds. He then looked at the brochure of the Subaru 360. Weight 900 pounds. This meant that the Subaru 360 would not be classified as a motor vehicle and did not need to comply with the new rules. He found a loophole and before you know it, a company by the name of Subaru of America was born, the official importer of Subaru vehicles. But let's face it, would this car be a success? You are looking at a very small and cheap car with a 10 year old design, sold in a time when shiny big cars were the norm. Malcolm didn't care at all, he strived to make sure he would sell the cheapest and most fuel efficient car in America and this level of perseverance will continue to show throughout the video. The 360 became a relative success. By the late 60s, some 10,000 Subaru 360s were sold at a base price of $1,300. In comparison, for double the price you had a compact car offering from the big American car companies. Would Subaru take over the American car market? Well, it was about to be if it wasn't for a test drive done by Consumer Reports. They did a test to determine the crash worthiness of the 360. And you know what they put it up against? A standard full-size American car, with a bit of luck four or even five times the weight of the 360. Uh, that's like putting me into a boxing ring trying to fight Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and don't be surprised if you won't see any more automotive history episodes anymore after that. 
Unfair testing or not, the whole article just grilled the Subaru. It was highly unsafe, dangerously slow, lacked any form of expected comfort. It was cheap, yeah, for a new car. But Consumer Reports recommended to buy at least a second-hand Volkswagen Beetle if you wanted basic and reliable transportation, and not this death trap. It put things into perspective, especially around the start of the 70s when the buying public became more conscious about vehicle safety and emissions. The damage was done and no one wanted a Subaru 360 anymore. Entering the mid-1970s and safety is the name of the game. Massive bumpers, soft interior materials, three-point seat belts, the works. In the meantime, Malcolm sold his stake of the Subaru of America company back to Fuji Heavy Industries, but now known as Subaru. They would take it over from there and further develop the brand in America, after a rocky introduction. With the big money earned by selling his stake, he once again set out to fulfill a long-life dream, his own car company. And lessons were learned. If the Subaru 360 is anything but safety, the new car was going to be nothing but safety. With no knowledge of the car industry and his usual level of perseverance, he went to work to create his own car company and to once again shake up the existing industry by making it revolutionary. He named his company General Vehicles. How the hell he got away with that name, I have no clue, but whatever. The Subaru was the cheapest car in America. This was going to be the safest car in America. The development started out with the Grey Ghost concept vehicle. The prototype was developed in utmost secrecy and when the work was done, it was presented to a local bank in search for financing the venture. It was a success. The bank was impressed, but as soon as Malcolm moved the car to Detroit to show it to the automotive establishment, he was greeted with mockery. The designers of the big car companies told him that, yeah, it looks great, but it was as impractical as it could be to mass produce it. To design a cool looking car is one thing, but to design it in such a way to make it easy to manufacture is a whole other thing. Back to the drawing board? Eh, kinda. Malcolm persuaded designers to come along with him, with the promise that they could freely design a car from the ground up and not listen from orders from upstairs, like at the current job. One designer went along with him and started to work at a more realistic version of the Grey Ghost, now dubbed the Red Car. The time frame? 90 days. The industry norm? 3 years when it comes to developing a new car. The reason? Money. The end result was the Bricklin SV1 for 1974, where SV1 stands for Safety Vehicle 1. You are looking at a two-seater sports car with the looks of contemporary Ferraris, Lamborghinis and the like. Quite a fresh design for the time period and it was regarded as a Corvette killer back in the USA. The SV1 was Malcolm's way of saying safety should not be boring, it can be sexy. The car was highly advanced for the time when it comes to safety equipment and far exceeded the safety requirements. It had a steel perimeter frame with tubular steel cage around the passenger compartment, along with an integral roll bar. The body was made out of fiberglass with an acrylic top layer which had the color of the car molded in so that it would not be scratched or dented in case of a minor bump. It had 10 mile per hour crash absorbing bumpers when 5 mile per hour bumpers were the norm and they were tastefully incorporated into the body. Especially when you compare it to the great walls of China that graced many front ends of American cars at the time. It also had no ashtray or cigarette lighter. Malcolm thought that smoking while driving was dangerous, like <laughs> puff away all you want but not behind the wheel for Pete's sake. That's a serious health hazard. Oh, and it had going doors. Why? Because they look cool, that's why. Uh, Malcolm said so himself. It had to have wing doors for that extra appeal. So, things were slowly panning out, but Malcolm had no assembly line ready at his fingertips. Where should the car be produced? Well, as luck would have it, the premier of a Canadian province, New Brunswick, was looking for companies to invest in the disaster-struck area in an effort to revitalize the economy and not have a backwater image. 
Malcolm had no clue where New Brunswick was, but he also didn't care. After meeting with the Premier, the project was greenlit and Malcolm could build a factory in New Brunswick, Canada. This, strictly speaking, makes the SV-1 a Canadian car, but I think that's debatable. It was a match made in heaven. Malcolm sought help and funding from local government, and the local government sought ways to reinvent the economy with the help of this new cool car company with revolutionary cars. Anyway, from here things went south. The car was ready, but the assembly wasn't. The process of making the car took way too long and in the meantime huge amounts of money was spent to keep things going. What also didn't help is that the factory was occupied by low-skilled workers, part of an unemployment program where in order to receive social welfare for a year, you only had to work 10 weeks. It didn't matter what you did, as long as it took 10 weeks. The people on the line had no previous experience with the advanced materials they worked with, resulting in low-quality cars with all the usual suspects built into them. The car cost $16,000 per unit to be built, but only sold for $5,000, and that was already Corvette's territory. The car was plagued with all kinds of little things, from badly assembled parts to low-level fit and finishing. For instance, the gullwing doors were cool, but also very heavy to lift up. A hydraulic pump would do the trick, if it worked. And if it didn't, like most of the time, the doors were too heavy for people to lift up, and they were essentially trapped. So much for safety. Still, the car generated a lot of publicity and interest with thousands of orders, but the production was still an utter mess. In the meantime, the Canadian government already spent $15 million on the SV-1 Adventure and decided it was enough. They pulled the plug out of the Bricklin Car Company and without financial aid, Malcolm couldn't pay it all out of its own pockets. After three years and some 3,000 cars built, the fairy tale that was the Bricklin SV-1 was over. After the fiasco that was the Bricklin SV-1, Malcolm was at it again with now a slightly better understanding of the car industry and his usual sense of perseverance. And although he had no plans to start up another car company, he resorted to what he was already good at – trading, or importing vehicles. Italian car maker Fiat decided a couple years earlier to pull itself from the American car market. YAY, or International Automobile Importers, was his new company that imported Fiat sports cars to fill the small gap and need for semi-fuel efficient sporty cars that gave you the sports car experience on a budget. And although Fiat would supply some of the cars and equipment, Malcolm turned to famous Italian coach builders Pininfarina and Bertone to add some updates and upgrades to the aging cars and also apply their names to the models. Because, ooh, it's from Bertone, that'll sell well. And so the aging Fiat 124 Spider and the X1-9 from the 60s became the Pininfarina Azura and the Bertone X1-9, made ready for the 80s. Straight up rebadges. How the hell he got away by applying both these names, I have no clue, but whatever. Suddenly, Pininfarina and Bertone didn't design bodies, they made complete cars. And all was well if it wasn't for Cadillac that started to interfere with the niche sports car business. In an attempt to reinvent itself, Cadillac released the Alante, a roadster designed and manufactured by Pininfarina through a joint venture. And suddenly it was Cadillac that complained that they could not sell their $55,000 Pininfarina sports car next to a $14,000 Pininfarina sports car. And the fairy tale that was the International Automobile Importers was over. After the fiasco that was the Pininfarina, Malcolm was at it again with now a slightly better understanding of the car industry and his usual sense of perseverance. Malcolm wanted to pull another Subaru 360 in the economic crisis-ridden 1980s by importing once again the cheapest car for America. But what was the cheapest car that money could buy at the time? As it turns out, it was the Zastava Coral, built by the Yugoslavian car company Zastava, a typical communist compact car based on the Fiat 128. 
Malcolm had no clue what a Yugoslavia was, but he didn't care. He found the cheapest car in the world and wanted to sell it in America. But in order to do that, some 600 changes were made to further improve the bottom of the barrel economy car in terms of safety and equipment. And in 1985, the Yugo, abbreviation of Yugoslavia and the play on words of you go, was introduced in America for a base price of just under 4,000 bucks, which is just under 10,000 bucks in today's money. Imagine buying a new car for just under 10k. Malcolm introduced a wide variety of models. The base level was the GV, which stands for Great Value, believe it or not, but you could work your way up all the way to a GVX, the sports model. And you know what? It was actually a success. The Yugo became the fastest selling European car in America ever, with some 160,000 units sold in just three years. How about that? All that tasty stuff from Europe and <laughs> a communist car is all you need to just make millions. Quality-wise, the car wasn't all that bad. <laughs> I mean, th there wasn't a lot of things that could break on the car. But the car instantly generated controversial reviews by the automotive press, being the culmination of everything that is wrong with the communist car industry. The Yugo became a cult classic, for better or for worse. After four years, Malcolm sold his stake in Yugo in 1988, and that was a wise decision for once. Because one, the car became increasingly harder to justify in the light of the ever more stringent safety and emission laws, and two, in the early 90s, the United Nations imposed sanctions on Yugoslavia, and Zastava was forced to withdraw the cars from all the export markets, including the US. By the 1990s, after the success of the Yugo, Malcolm was swimming in cash and at it again with now a slightly better understanding of the car industry and his usual sense of perseverance. Some 30 years before they became mainstream, Malcolm already showed interest in the concept of electric vehicles. He came up with an idea of a conversion company. For 10 grand, your car could be converted to run on electricity. But much in the same way like today, the battery capacity was the bottleneck. He then focused on electric bikes, but that went nowhere as it was also a bit too early for that time. By the start of the 2000s, Malcolm wanted to pull another Subaru 360, or Yugo if you will, by once again importing low-priced cars, value for money. He once again looked all over the world and found, surprisingly, or maybe not all too surprising, China to be a good candidate. Around this time, the Chinese car industry was just picking up speed in its development. The cars were still laughably cheap, for all the wrong reasons, but they were getting there. And so Malcolm eventually ended up with the government-backed Chinese brand Cherry, the 11th largest company at the time. A company called Visionary Vehicles was born that had the importation rights of the Chinese Cherry. How the hell he got away with a name like that considering that other car company that sounds very similar, I have no clue, but whatever. Malcolm envisioned to sell Mercedes-slash-BMW type cars for Honda prices. After a multi-million investment and a complete setup of agreements and dealer networks and promotions all over the US, the great influx of the cheap Chinese cars was about to start. Or was it? Malcolm found out that the Chinese had a different sense of doing honest business, and behind the back of Malcolm and Visionary Vehicles, Cherry also made a deal with the Chrysler Corporation to work on a project that would eventually never realize. Not only that, Cherry also made a deal with another company without notifying and excluding Visionary Vehicles. And on top of all this, an executive within Visionary Vehicles also used proprietary information to help Cherry. The deal with the Chinese had gone bust, and before a Cherry would ever reach the American shores, the fairy tale that was Visionary Vehicles and the introduction of Chinese cars was over. After the fiasco of visionary vehicles, Malcolm was at it again with now a slightly better understanding of the car industry and his usual sense of a word that you probably can guess by now what I would say. At the age of 83, he is still as vigorous as ever and tries to flirt with the idea of making his own electric car company, much like Tesla. 
The Bricklin EV3 is his latest and greatest effort venturing into the EV car game. The EV3 is an urban three-wheeler with a competitive price, and still falls under the visionary vehicle name. And when you look at that, the going doors are once again back. Who knows? Maybe this will be the last and most definitive success. The closing chapter in a roller coaster ride like life, full of twists and turns and hills and drops. The life and legend of Malcolm Bricklin.